After weeks of unveiling new weapons, harassing U.S. allies, and snide remarks, China's threats and saber-rattling have reached a new and dangerous level today. Good evening, I'm Leland Bitter. We're going to get to the Chinese military advances in a moment. But first, there is breaking news out of Washington we need to tell you about. Congress did its job. Yes, as surprising as that may be to you at home and to some of us here, Congress mustered up the courage, went out there, and actually passed a bill. So for all of you who are worried that the government was going to shut down, it's not going to, don't worry. Other shows would spend the next hour covering the ins and outs of this short-term spending plan, we're probably not that concerned with it, which means that you at home really don't care. There were some theatrics by progressives today that forced Nancy Pelosi to delay yet another vote on President Biden's agenda. The negotiations continue. We're going to head back to D.C., where we understand that there possibly are going to be some votes late tonight. We'll head back to D.C. as news warrants. Now we want to move on to our top story. The clear and growing threat of China that just increased by an order of magnitude. We're going to set the stage for you right now. The communist regime in Beijing played center stage at this week's testimony by America's chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He testified U.S. intelligence indicated the Chinese were either scared of or even preparing for a U.S. strike in the last six months of the Trump administration, creating the potential for deadly miscalculation. Hence, two calls by General Milley himself to his Chinese counterpart and now the Chinese are doing nothing to diffuse things. This is the latest headline, and it's an important one to look at. Let us meet in the sky. China boasts U.S. Air Force should fear new arsenal. That's the headline. The exact quote by the deputy Air Force commander is, I can only say if they are not scared, let us meet in the sky. The comments come as China unveiled their loyal wingman armed drone at an air show. It's an upgrade of another Chinese drone with a range of about 2,200 miles. China continues to expand their ability to project force well beyond its borders. We want to take you over here to the touch screen to show you why that 2,200 mile range matters so much. So China can base their drones here anywhere along their coast. Spratly Islands, Vietnam, 1,800 miles. The Philippines, another U.S. ally, 1,700 miles here to Manila, shorter here. But that drone now can, can totally patrol this area of the South China Sea where almost half of the world's shipping goes through. Taiwan, U.S. ally, 1,300 miles. Japan, 1,800 miles. South Korea, 1,300 miles. Still 6,000 miles away to Hawaii, not threatened there. The Chinese also unveiled this, which is key. We're going to show you this missile here, and we're going to move up in the prompter a little bit. They unveiled a missile right now that was called... We have the missile? We don't have the missile. But it's called the YJ-18E, writing that the YJ-18 missile system uses a combined mechanism of subsonic cruise and supersonic strike showing advantages on both ends, the long-range cruise ability of subsonic missiles and the end-phase attacks by supersonic missiles. Back to the touchscreen, these would be called area denial weapons. What does that mean? You base those weapons anywhere here along the Chinese coast, you deny the U.S. Navy any ability to operate here, the ability to project force into the South China Sea, and the ability to protect our allies here even down here towards Australia. Beijing's communist mouthpiece newspaper, The Global Times, also published this picture of their GJ-11 drone. It's a stealth drone seen now for the first time with open weapons bays displaying four smart bombs per weapons bay. The Economist writes of China's current saber rattling. When China wants to be feared, taking Canadian hostages was a message to America's allies. Surprisingly often, Chinese diplomacy resembles an iron fist in a silk glove, depending on political winds back home, meaning in Beijing. China's envoys learned to balance fist-waving threats with silken words about peace and friendship. Just now, the gloves are coming off. Gordon Chang writes extensively about China and understands the communist leadership better than just about anybody he's standing by. Major General Vincent Bold spent decades in the United States Army, an expert on foreign weapons systems, and joins us uh, as well. Uh, Gordon, start with you. Any peaceful explanation, either A, for the weapon systems, or B, showing them off? Absolutely not. 
you know, China says, well, it just wants to defend itself. Well, it is building weapons that are generally considered to be offensive. So clearly Beijing is on a rampage. And also we've got to remember that within the last six weeks, they've made threats to use nuclear weapons against both Japan and Australia, neither of which threatened China. So right now, with their mil uh, building missile silos, about 345 of them, we can see that they don't want what's called a minimal deterrent. What they want is a war fighting capability, specifically the capability to intimidate other countries, including the U.S., to surrender without fighting. Uh, General, I think the other word for that would be first strike capability. Of the weapon systems that we talked about and other ones that you've been researching, which one scares you the most? Uh, their missile capability. Uh, that, that would be that we have uh, 11 nuclear aircraft carriers. They have two conventional carriers. Uh, Navy, we talk about size, but our Navy is much more capable. Uh, the thing that would keep me awake at night are their missile capabilities and their air defense capabilities if we were to launch missiles against them. Gordon, you study what's happening in Beijing intimately, understand the Communist Party. Why now? I think there are a number of things going on, Leland. Um, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has taken power from everybody, which means he's now got more or less full accountability. He's also raised the cost of losing political struggles. He's being criticized for policy failures. I'm sure he's feeling pretty vulnerable. And if he could, and I'm not saying he can, but if he could, he could create military misadventure abroad to unify the party. You know, Xi Jinping right now is doing things that Mao Zedong, his hero, did, the founder of the People's Republic, in terms of trying to rally the Chinese people um, against his political enemies. Well, Mao didn't have the capability to start a war to do that, but Xi Jinping does. At least if you listen to the Chinese, of course, uh, they have no interest in war, of course. As you pointed out, Gordon, they say everything is just to defend themselves. Take a listen to the Chinese defense minister spokesman. All right, uh, principal and most important line of that, China's sovereignty, dignity, and core interests are not to be infringed upon. Uh, General, do they have more capabilities than they need to just make sure mainland China isn't threatened? Oh, very, very much so. No, th their uh, army is predominantly in their neighborhood base there, so I don't see them projecting a military ground force. Uh, but I would be concerned uh, about their missile forces, I said before, and uh, they have more than enough capability to defend themselves. That capability is designed, as you said uh, in your in, uh, introductory piece, area denial and deny us, threaten us from coming into their area. Uh, real quick, General, uh, before I get Gordon here, this video, uh, the Daily Caller flagged, it was taken near a U.S. Uh, military base. Uh, showing something we've never seen before. It almost looks like a bat wing that's uh, locked down to a trailer. Nobody will talk about it or comment about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it a surprise, perhaps, or an accident that we now suddenly have video of this thing on the same day the Chinese have been showing off all their drones? Well, as, as with all things, as Gordon would say, as with all things with China, one never knows for sure. Uh, but, uh, but that's a capability they have. The thing that concerns me about the drone is the stealth capability of the drone. Yeah. Not only can you make a lot of them, but we won't be able to see them, and that, uh, that's pretty significant. Yeah, we want to be clear. This was actually seen in the United States uh, near one of Lockheed's uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. Gordon, uh, last question to you. What's next that we need to watch from by China? What would scare you? I think that it's probably... There's a couple of places. One of them would be Taiwan, of course. We see these almost daily flights into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, which is still international airspace, but it is hostile. We see, Jap we see uh, Japan's waters being invade in incurred by the Chinese. They almost daily around the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. And remember, we've got Chinese troops south of the line of actual control in Ladakh, which is generally considered to be Indian territory. Mm -hmm. So around China's periphery to the the south and to the east, there are aggressive Chinese moves against its neighbors. Yeah, and we remember that battle with some Indian troops. It didn't have weapons, but it was awfully uh, bloody. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Leland. Thank you. The Communist Party's censorship arm now extends far beyond its borders, far beyond its military reach as well. 
to America and U.S. tech giants are now bowing to Beijing in ways that we have never seen before. This morning, Axios reported LinkedIn blocked the profiles of several U.S. journalists from the company's China-based platform this week, citing prohibited content. One of those belongs to Axios author Bethany Alam Ebrahimian. Within hours, Florida Senator Rick Scott said, I am deeply concerned that an American company is actively censoring American journalists on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. He might be concerned, but there's not much he can do about it. Bethany Allen Ebrahimian joins us now. Bethany, good to see you. What'd you do to make Beijing so angry? Well, I'm not exactly sure because LinkedIn did not tell me what the quote unquote prohibited content in my uh, LinkedIn profile was. However, I have written extensively about the genocide that the Chinese government is committing in Xinjiang against Uyghurs. I've written extensively about the Chinese government's uh, covert political influence abroad. So it could be any number of those topics. Yeah, I, I believe you were part of the reporting on Eric Swalwell, correct, that Axios did? Yes, yeah. that's correct. I was the lead reporter on that story yeah, as well. In incredible reporting. One question. Do you think this had more to do with the content that you reported and you do report and you put up on your LinkedIn page or denying you the ability to use LinkedIn to reach sources in China? I think it's probably the, the first. So what we have seen from the Chinese government, especially under Xi Jinping and especially in the past few years, is a growing desire to silence uh, any kind of speech or act, increasingly even action abroad that goes against certain Chinese Communist Party core interests. And that uh, mostly the desire there, at least for a while, has been to prevent people inside of China from seeing that content. Although we are increasingly seeing the Chinese government's ability and desire to remove speech uh, from around the world that it actually does yeah. not uh, support. Is this, is this the break in the dam, if you will, of LinkedIn now bowing to Beijing the, or, or not? Well, it's actually a very interesting phenomenon here because in the past, what we have seen is the Chinese government using its own capabilities or requiring Chinese companies in China to hire their own censors, you know, pr a sort of private army of censors to censor content on the internet inside of China. What's new here is that this is a U.S company uh, using their own employees. I received an email from LinkedIn itself using their own employees to go through profiles and censor on behalf of the Chinese government. So wow. LinkedIn was, yeah, LinkedIn was sort of put through, a, if you will call it a rectification uh, back a few months ago. Uh, Beijing got very upset with them for their lax censorship of their Chinese platform. This is clearly in response to certain demands that were put on LinkedIn. Yeah, well, now and now in LinkedIn, uh, as we said in the beginning, bowed to uh, the Chinese. Uh, Bethany, awesome reporting all the way around. It says a lot uh, by who your enemies are, clearly those in Beijing. Come back and talk to us as you get more stuff, all right? I would be glad to. Yeah, great to see you. The case involving Gabby Petito's missing boyfriend just keeps getting weirder. FBI agents returned to Brian Laundrie's home today to grab a few of his personal items, and now... He allegedly bought a burner phone on the day of his disappearance. Of course, burner phones make it a lot harder for the police to track him. This is police are still searching for signs of Brian in a large nature preserve in Sarasota County, Florida, not far from his parents' home. News Nation's Brian Enton has been following the case for I don't know how many days and weeks it's all uh, run together, Brian, but uh, great reporting. And now we really have to wonder how many phones Brian may or may not have. Yeah, well, first of all, I think this is day 16 that we have been just camped outside the laundry house trying to watch their every move and understand exactly what happened here. And the phone situation with Brian Laundry is perhaps one of the most confusing things to keep track of. It, you go back to the body camera video from August when uh, Brian and Gabby had that altercation. In that body camera video, Brian at one point said he didn't have a phone, then said he did have a phone. Now there's this question of did he buy a phone, a burner phone that could not be traced after he got back in Gabby's van without Gabby. Uh, it's very, very confusing. What we've been able to nail down from the attorney, and keep in mind this is from uh, the laundry family attorney, uh, Mr. Bertolino, he says that the family and Brian did in fact buy a phone 
after Brian got back in Gabby's van without Gabby at an AT&T store near here. Uh, but according to the attorney, they uh, that when Brian went missing, he left the phone in the house behind me. And the attorney says the FBI has that phone right now. Hmm. But the attorney won't comment on whether or not there were other phones that were purchased. Exactly. We asked the attorney about other phones. Was there another phone that he had when he was on the journey uh, with Gabby? And he wouldn't comment. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Brian, keep up the great reporting. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. Yeah, those trying to avoid law enforcement using burner phones is not a new thing. Ed Gavin runs a private investigation company, has extensive uh, work done in tracking folks and also in the issues of burner phones, uh, joins us now. Uh, Ed, it seems as though Brian could have as many phones as he wanted, right? I would think so. I mean, they're easy, easily obtainable in Walmart, Best Buy. You can buy them in bulk. Uh, you don't have to present any identification. You can use cash. So it's entirely possible. Uh, there was a 2016 law that went into effect, or that was proposed, I should say, did not go into effect, that would have required you to have an ID and show an ID to buy a phone so you could match the SIM card and the electronic serial number of the phone to a person. Uh, that law was shot down. It seems as though that could have helped in this case and a lot of others. Probably could have. Um, most of the people I deal with, human trafficking victims, they're female. Uh, they're generally in possession of these track phones, these burner phones, throw, throw away phones, whatever you, whatever you want to call them. And they're very difficult to track for sure. So it's very difficult. It would be very difficult to track if somebody was being smuggled would be, but also if somebody uh, was about to go on the run, it would make sense that they would buy additional phones. I would think so. I mean, I just walked into a Boost Mobile store, too, before I came on the show. And for 115 bucks, I can get uh, a smartphone with 30 days of service and uh, unlimited talk and text. So these are obtainable, and you don't have to present identification. And certainly, uh, the criminals will be using them for sure. And in most of my cases, they certainly do. Interesting. Interesting. You think about, as we look uh, beyond the Gabby Petito case, obviously one that we're keeping an eye on, but the spike in murders around the United States, the sp spike in violent crime around the United States, Seattle murder up almost 75 percent, New Orleans up almost 62 percent, Atlanta uh, up almost 58 uh, percent. Is what you just described, being able to buy phones with no identification and for cash, uh, making it harder for police nationwide on this? I, I didn't hear that, that question. Uh, I guess what I'm just asking is, is is just how easy it is to get burner phones go beyond human trafficking and missing people to making murders harder to solve, drug trafficking harder to solve, and the like. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we're putting up some of these statistics as well. A new record rise in the murder rate up 30% in 2020 versus the 12.7% uh, previous record for uh, increases. Ed, uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. As the Gabby case continues, we're going to have you back to talk about it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great conversation. Thank you. All right, coming up on the program. Tried to fill up lately, 350 at the pump. If you think that's high, just wait till you hear the multi-million dollar bet some traders have made on how high gas will go. But first, News Nation's Ashley Banfield joins us live to set the record straight after a tell-all book from Katie Couric took aim at Ashley's father. Ashley, see you in a minute. When I was in Afghanistan, um, there were a lot of reports about it being a very dangerous assignment, and a New York Post reporter got the home phone number of my father, who was near 80 and extremely senile and living in a care home. They called and said, are you afraid for your daughter? To which he said, yes. And I think NBC should bring her home and give her a desk job like Katie's. That is a far cry from being able to even leave that facility, let alone telling anyone who would listen. So that hurt my feelings deeply. That caught our eye last night. Ashley Banfield responding to former Today Show host Katie Couric. Couric just wrote a book titled Going There. And as you could tell, she went there about Ashley and her father, writing, quote, for a minute there, Ashley Banfield was the next big thing. I'd heard her father was telling anyone who'd listen that she was going to replace me. In that environment, mentorship sometimes felt like self-sabotage. With us, Ashley Banfield, back again. Uh, you know, Ashley, you really had to feel bad for Katie Couric because she just wanted to mentor so many people. And she just couldn't because she was just too threatened, I guess. 
I mean, I really don't know what um, her motivation was back then. You know, I was a, a pretty small potato, um, and Katie was the, you know, $15 million woman. Uh, I'm astounded uh, today to, to hear that that's how she felt about me. And at the same time, I guess I also understand what being a woman in journalism, especially on television, has been like. Uh, I've been in this business 33 years now, Leland, and you know, we've always been told you got a shelf life sister. So <laughs> maybe that's how Katie felt in the early mm -hmm. 2000s. We've all felt we've had a shelf life and past 40, find another job. Well, uh, we're honored to have you here with us uh, as both a mentor, <laughs> a friend and a colleague. Um, I guess the, the question I would have is, it feels like this says a lot more about Katie Couric than it does about you. I mean, maybe that's true. Look, I, I don't know what her motivation is to write a book like this. Um, I, listen, Leland, I don't have to tell you, and I don't have to tell our viewers that every one of us who's alive could write a book like Going There, right? We could all write about the crap that we have swum through, uh, the people that we have despised or have despised us, the garbage, the, the you know, petty stuff, the office pol We could all write it. We could all write it. But should we? Um, I personally don't think it's necessary. Um, we are who we um, curate as our legacies and images, mm -hmm. right? And I want people to think about the great work that I have done in my uh, years in this business. I don't want people to think about the spats or skirmishes that, that I may have been in. You think about it, if she's going to attack you and your dad, okay, she's going to attack a lot of other people in this book. We don't know what, what's in it because we just have a couple of excerpts so far. But I, you get the feeling that it is a woman in Kirk writing who is so different than what we saw on TV. She's this deeply insecure, deeply angry, sort of scorned woman rather than America's sweetheart. There were, there were a lot of rumors, you know, and I, I'm the first person to say there were a lot of rumors about me, too, and I wouldn't believe all the rumors that you hear about people on TV because people love to talk. <laughs> but I think what's really important is, uh, look, I feel for Katie. I do. Um, it is true that we have always been afraid of aging and we've always been afraid of being uh, sent off because the next young thing comes along. So in that respect, I get it. I completely get uh, what she's writing about. What I really took umbrage about was that she, you know, characterized my late father who was ailing, saying that he was out sort of flitting about telling anyone who would listen that I, I should take her job. That just wasn't true at all. Now, it really broke my heart that she would take, you know, a, an old headline that wasn't even vetted and sort of make it bigger than it than it was. So I, I kind of just sort of stopped down right there and said, no, no, I'm, I'm going to defend my dad's honor. And um, and then, you know, the interviews have come out and I've really been uh, introspective about what women's role on television and in the workplace is. And I think that the mentoring that I have chosen to done, by the way, uh, great thanks to my mother's suggestion long ago, who was a working woman in the 60s. It has been hugely valuable to me. I mean, I remember bumping into you for the first time and we talked shop and, you know, you're younger than I am. And all I could think of was like all the great things that you're going to do on this network. I was thrilled you were going to be here. And it's the same when I run into young women or young men even who are coming in behind me. I feel delighted if they want to know what I think about something or if they want my advice. I, it just makes me feel like a titan. Yeah, you're right in the sense that we all owe our careers now to somebody who came before us. If you read some of the headlines from her and what she's saying and talking about how, uh, you know, there's always a younger thing coming and how then she went after Prince Harry because she was sort of scared and trying to find her voice and on and on. It, it gets me to this reason. You, you said at one point her salary was $15 million. Do you think part of the reason for the insecurity and always being fearful about somebody younger and somebody else around the corner is this knowledge by most of us, not all of us on television, that it would be very difficult to be paid anywhere close to what we're getting paid doing any other job? You're darn right. And let's not forget, she had lost her husband. Uh, she was a single mother living in the most expensive city, you know, in, in the country, raising two daughters. So I'm sure she felt a great deal of pressure to continue raising her daughters in the lifestyle that they had become accustomed. And that is completely fair. 
Um, and yeah, so just realize that there is no other job in this industry, or I think others, unless you're a hedge funder and way smarter than me with numbers, uh, that will pay the kind of money that Katie was making. And when I say 15, that was just what the headline said. I don't know what she was making. Could have been more, could have been less. I just know it was a lot more than what I was making. Do you think there was a sense in this book, and or maybe we'll see it or not, of some kind of uh, mea culpa to her fans? Is this a, is this a comeback to her? Or, and if so, is, it, is this how she genuinely feels? Is this an attempt to sell books? What is it? Man, those are good questions. Um, you know, just based on the com well, I can't, I can't get into her head. That's for starters. Uh, well, you, but, I mean, you, but right, but you worked comments. with her, you knew her. So give us, give us a sense. I mean, eh, you know, I, I kind of, I, I mean, I, she's on the Today Show and I was over on the little startup network, MSNBC, and I, I always felt that way, too, um, the, the way MSNBC did was she, thought of Did she of treat you then. that way? <laughs> you know, you know I, I honestly, I, I, I don't want to go into, <laughs> okay. you know, the... the Fair, working relationships and the incidents and all the rest like I, I really believe that she is a solid solid unbelievably talented professional broadcaster I'd really prefer for people to think of her that way but to her motivation for writing the book I think Leland you and I could probably learn a lot from this because we're just behind her right me not so much you more um, and and that is like how do we want our legacy to be hmm. you know what how do you want people to remember Leland Vitter when you're you know dead and gone you, you want you want people to think the best of you and I just don't know that this is going to do it so I, I can't say what her motivation is for it all right uh, fair enough I just got a text from my uh, dear mother who's watching uh, saying uh, quote Banfield's excellent uh, and enjoyed so much uh, oh. hearing your thoughts uh, graceful uh, honest charming is as always thank you well can you tell your mom Mrs. Vitter you do great work <laughs> you're, you're very kind. Ashley, uh, we'll see you tonight, uh, a couple of hours from now. I know you're talking about Gabby, among other things. Thanks. Thanks for the time. Indeed. Thanks, Leland. All right. 60 Minutes is promising a big exclusive interview with a Facebook whistleblower, but will the interview really tell us something we didn't already know about the social media giant? But first, inflation impacting our lives every day. Now there's a sign that especially at the gas pump, it is going to get a lot worse. Normally, you can't talk about Christmas until after Halloween. Well, you need to start thinking about it now, because if the Grinch doesn't steal Christmas, high prices and logistical nightmares very well might. A new report estimates price increases on everything that makes the most wonderful time of the year wonderful. Those price increases could hit 20% on everything from toys to decorations to food, and that's if you can find it. Retailers and manufacturers alike say they can't get production from China and Asia into their warehouses because of shipping delays, that sends the price of shipping way up, now passed on to you. A big part of the cost of shipping is fuel prices. Oil is now at a three-year high. The price of oil is now nearly $80 a barrel. Gas prices are up more than a dollar since last year. The average price nationwide, $3.27 a gallon. And a lead we never thought we would write. A U.S. senator is now commenting on the dollar store. And also inflation. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. In West Virginia, I just saw the day to where the, uh, to where the one dollar, uh, what we call general dollar store, dollar general, they're not more, they're no longer dollar general. They're a dollar and a quarter, a dollar fifty cent general. That's hard for West Virginia. A lot of people do, do shop there. Hard for people around the country. More importantly, that store that he was talking about, Dollar General, is now the dollar plus, lots of cents store, because higher costs of the dollar store announced it would raise prices to more than a dollar on a number of their items. That's Dollar General. Dollar Store was the one that released that statement. Brings us to some truly scary news. Some of the smartest and richest traders in the world are betting that $80 a barrel for oil and $350 for gas are going to seem cheap. New information shows they think $200 a barrel, more than double where we're at right now, is, quote, possible and are wagering millions of dollars on that hunch. That would roughly translate to $8 or more for gas. Potentially, you could have gas shortages. Today's headline from the Financial Post reads, someone is betting oil will soar to a record $200 a barrel. A growing number of options traders are betting that an energy crunch this winter may see prices rip higher. Joining us now, Rebecca Walser, financial analyst and president of Walser Wealth Management. Uh, you think this is more than a hunch, or are they reading the tea leaves and then betting on that? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think to, to say $200 a barrel, if you think, Leland, the, the highest we've had in most recent memory is $160 a barrel in 2008. So they they have some data. Clearly, they have some data. You don't bet millions of dollars without data. So they have some data that definitely is letting them know that, you know, inflationary pressure, transportation pressure, problems with China, supply chain problems, a lot of issues coming out of oil that could create the perfect storm storm of uh, circumstances to get us to an extremely high cost per barrel. And of course, that does translate into the gas pump. Well, the gas pump and the cost to ship things and the cost of goods. Everything. $200 a barrel, those are, that's shock waves. That's not just prices going up. Um, yeah, that's economic collapse. Absolutely, without a doubt, uh, Leland. I don't, I, like, except for maybe the 70s and 80s of hyperinflation, I don't know that we've ever had pump prices anywhere near that. Yeah, and, and certainly, certainly things go up. Uh, real quick, this is what the White House had to say today on gas prices. Take a listen. Obviously, the price of oil is of concern. We have been in touch with OPEC, um, and I believe it was going to be raised, but I haven't had a chance to get a, a readout beyond that. Is that an admission that the White House may not be able to do, do anything about this? Yeah, I mean, OPEC, you know, cut things obviously drastically last year when coronavirus hit. But the problem is they are only incrementally raising their production by um, 0.4, you know, percent per, per month. So it's going to take literally uh, over a year, 14 and a half months to get back to the production levels that we had pre-corona. So it is an indication that we're not getting a lot of cooperation um, between the United States and OPEC. Yeah, um and certainly uh, regulation in South Texas and for oil, uh, the wildcatters down there in Texas and Oklahoma isn't helping either. Rebecca, great exactly. conversation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah good Thanks for you. having me. She left Facebook concerned with copies of thousands of pages of research. What don't they want you to know? The Facebook whistleblower, only on 60 Minutes Sunday. She left Facebook. Hmm. New show 60 Minutes is tied in a revealing segment with a former Facebook employee saying the social media site is lying to the public and the feds about how detrimental the platform can be. Well, yes, true. Do we need an, in, do, do we need an interview and a whistleblower to uh, tell us that? Man Cow, yes. who's with us, you already knew that. Uh, are, are you kidding? I, I, got, uh, I got put in jail, Facebook jail, because I made fun of a guy that killed a cop. I made fun of the Taliban. And got in trouble. Are you kidding me? Look, 3 billion people. Check this thing out. 3 billion people. It is social engineering. It is uh, far to the left. Communist, I say. And uh, it's wrong. And it should be broken up. It's interesting because this whistleblower report allegedly says that they are putting profits over safety. Mm -hmm. Are they motivated by profits in one area or are they motivated by being seen and Mark Zuckerberg yeah. getting right, invited to the right party so he bans you and Donald Trump? Well, listen, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is uh, something that Ian Fleming would have created for a James Bond novel. Uh, you know what I always say? But he looks great surfing with sunscreen <laughs> on, okay? Do we have, I don't, I don't, I don't think, think we have that great. picture, but okay. Uh, I, the communism isn't cute to me. Uh, look, uh, uh, look, here's the deal. You, just remember this. Uh, it, it's not about the money. It's about the money. Of course it's about the money. It's always about the money. And uh, he so, has, so if it's about the money, yeah. what, what money and monetary value does Facebook get by banning you and by banning President Trump. Well, they're masters. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the master, look, they're, the Sherman Antitrust Act, they should be broken up. Let's start there. But, they're, you know, they're free from being sued. They cannot be sued. They're collecting money like crazy. Uh, their, their motivation is they're, you know, look, they collude with China. They're about censorship. They're about control. And right, I'm sure and they're well back, rewarded. You, you go back to this idea of antitrust. Yeah. Antitrust says that the consumer's being hurt, right? That you have to prove yeah. in order to break people up that yeah. the consumer's being hurt. How is the consumer who gets to go on this and talk to their friends and share pictures of their kids. How are they being hurt? <laughs> pictures of their what? Of their kids. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I don't know where your mind was, man, cows, but else. okay. Look, it started off as a, what, face mesh or something where you could make fun of uh, uh, girls at college. I mean, this, it was a really a slimy thing to begin with. Uh, uh, you know, it's, when you have that kind of control, it's, it's taxpayer paid for internet. We created this. This is ours, okay? They are a platform. They're not a publisher. They, don't have, they cannot be sued. That's a good Section, point. what is it? Uh, 230. Uh, 230 of the Communications Decency Act. 
Uh, they can't be sued. They are protected. And yet they seem to, look, brother, I can, I can uh, right now uh, get an ISIS flag and, and be pro-ISIS. If I say anything good about Jesus or Trump, I'm in trouble. I know because I've done it. I mean, this is madness. This is an anti-American company. They should be broken up. You're too young to remember probably, but Ma Bell was broken up. Sure. Well, you're old enough to remember. And uh, that's what we need to do here. Yeah, started, started, people. started with the oil companies. Now Ma yeah. Bell is back together, AT&T. Yeah. Uh, Man, Cal, good to see you. Always good to see uh, you. Always, yeah. always great conversation. Thanks, right. brother. After the break, back to the breaking news of Congress doing their job. No surprise, they're still far from doing it very well. Man, Cal agrees with that. Uh, but they're actually still working tonight, believe it or not, burning the 8 p.m. oil in Washington, D.C. We'll check in on what's happening at the Capitol. Well, the civil war among Democrats rages on as President Biden's agenda hangs in the balance. The progressives are angry with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The progressives who, progressives who are angry shut down the Golden Gate Bridge in her hometown of San Francisco this morning. Uh, you can see the shutdown on the other side of the highway there. Those progressives are outraged that Democrats' massive spending bills in Congress don't include amnesty for 11 million illegal immigrants already here in the United States. It's just one of the many complaints by members of Nancy Pelosi's own party that are giving the speaker a massive headache today. She's four days late on her own deadline for bringing one of the bills up for a vote. Right now, live pictures of the Capitol where they are burning the midnight oil, at least the 8 p.m. oil on Capitol Hill. Earlier, they passed a bill to fund the government. So if you were worried, the government's not going to shut down. President Biden just signed it. But Pelosi and the White House right now are trying to twist arms on the president's agenda. Here's the White House press secretary earlier today. The president, the speaker of the House, um, and the leader have more experience getting legislation across the finish line than any group of Democrat, Democratic leaders in history. We're in the middle of it right now. It's messy, this sausage making uh, on Capitol Hill. To make sense of all things, Washington, Chris Steyerwald, expert in politics, sausage making, bacon cooking, turkey frying. I feel as almost this is an insult to sausage makers. They are far more efficient than Congress. Well, now, the, the, the line that that comes from Otto von Bismarck, uh, his point is everybody wants to eat the sausage. Nobody wants to watch the sausage getting made. It's not supposed to be pretty. What we have in the United States now uh, is a problem where we don't legislate through the course of the year. We don't let the normal committee process work. We set cliffs and deadlines where things absolutely have to pass. We waste the rest of the time with people holding stupid hearings, tweeting tweets, and generally <laughs> jabberwockying. And then at the end, everybody jumps over Niagara together when they're faced with a government shutdown or when they're faced with a credit default. Only at the end do they do anything, and therefore what they do is going to be terrible. It's just the, it's the nature of how they do it. I don't know if jabberwocking uh, applies in this case, but Nancy Pelosi was on the phone at the congressional baseball game. She was quite animated. Uh, I don't know if that qualifies for jabberwocking. Uh, we have video of that. But I guess the question, uh, the question to you as we look forward on this is every day you don't get something done, does it become harder? No, it gets easier because they won't do anything when they can. We have two parties that refuse to be majority parties. Nobody wants to do the work of legislating. Nobody wants to compromise. Nobody wants to do anything except run for re-election in perpetuity. They just want to be, a, as uh, my friend and colleague Jonah Goldberg puts it, they just want to be a parliament of pundits. And they want to talk. That's my job. Why don't they let me do it and then they go do some legislating for a change? It's, it's so a the, because, it's, because it's infinitely harder to legislate than it is to be on TV. I don't know. It's a pretty good looking tie. I don't know. And, we'll, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll hand let history tied. sort it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Hand tied we'll the whole nine yards. You bring up the, this idea, though, of, of running, constantly running for election. In 2022 is going to be a, a, the, certainly the most divisive and brutal midterms we've ever been through because each one keeps getting uh, worse. Joe Manchin threw a wrench in everything today when he said, not 3.5 trillion, 1.5 trillion is my limit, and then threw down this. Take a listen. We only have 50 votes. Basically, take whatever we don't aren't able to come to agreement with today and take that on the campaign trail next year. And I'm sure that they'll get many more liberal, progressive Democrats with what they, they say they want. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing, well, so you got something good. 
Well, no, it's all, he's, he's saying, you like it so much, you go run for office on it. You like it so much, you go run for office on it. Here's what I'll give you. If you think that what you say is true, I, you have flashbacks to sort of the end of the Tea Party. The, the Democrats are dealing with their Tea Party phase right now with the, these very radical progressives. And what Manchin is saying to them is what the Republicans said to Ted Cruz and company when they had a shutdown back in 2013. You think it's so popular, you think it's so good, you go run for office on it. You see if the swing voters of the United States want to talk about it, and they don't. The reason that Republicans stuck Democrats with the debt ceiling left, and look, part of it was uh, spoil sportism. The Republicans incurred a lot of this debt because no one is, is watching the till, but they said they wouldn't do it. The reason they said they wouldn't do it was to put the extra heat on Manchin and others. So they wouldn't just have to increase the spending but they'd have to increase the debt in the same vote. And for Manchin, that's a non-starter. So he, my fellow West Virginian, Kristen Sinema uh, from Arizona, and a bunch of other people hiding behind Manchin's skirts who don't want to have to say it out loud, but are glad that he's doing it, and Democrats in the Senate say, thank goodness we can get this down to some place that will not be automatic death in the midterms. We've talked about this on the show a number of times. I wanted to get your thought. We'll go back to that protest on the Golden Gate Bridge saying that uh, something must be included in this big bill to allow a path to citizenship for 11 million uh, illegal immigrants here. Uh, is that dead on arrival on Capitol Hill right now? Absolutely, because the, so in the mid-1970s, they changed the rules in the Senate because it was make sure that we wouldn't have government shutdowns and there wouldn't be this, the, this kind of chicanery going on. So they said, look, on a budget resolution, you just need a simple majority. You don't need the 60 votes that you normally, normally need for, legis, uh, for legislation. But then the Senate parliamentarian has to decide, is this a budget and ta is it a tax and spending provision or not? If not, it can't come on, it can't ride the, it can't take the, the express lane and go here. It has to go through the regular process. The protesters and others who are complaining about what's not been allowed into this process, they don't care about the process. They want to get rid of the filibuster. They just want to drop the threshold for everything in the Senate to 51 votes. And guess what we have found out over the past 40 years of having a lower vote threshold? It doesn't get better. It doesn't create more cooperation. It doesn't pass but, things yeah. more quickly. It fails too. Yeah, it makes things, it makes things worse. I got about uh, 15 or 20 seconds. One of the smartest things you said to me uh, ever in your office was never bet against Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she says she's going to get this thing done tonight. You still wouldn't bet against her? Well, she's got a bowl of GR Deli chocolates in her office, and she's got a row of San Francisco Giants baseball bats, and Democrats can choose one or the other. They can have the sweet or they can have the crack in the head, and I bet she'll get it done. Uh, what, what a visual to end on, Chris. We'll see you soon. You bet. All right. Uh, a Florida man done good when we come back. All right, we showed you this video last night, and at the time, we only knew him as a Florida man with a trash can taking on an alligator. There he is. Yep, he took on the alligator. He fought the alligator, and he won, not the alligator. Eugene Bozzi is his name. There he is. And he's also a conservationist, because evidently he let the alligator go. He's on Prime with Marnie Hughes later tonight. Don't miss that. Dan Abrams Live is coming up next.